it, we should be really taking it much more serious. Jesus said some things, and most people will say, oh, Jesus was a great teacher. And the Sermon on the Mount, as we refer to it in Matthew 5, 6, and then 7, is full of profound teachings, in fact, radical teachings that Jesus is going to share with us. In our present environment, it is a very natural thing to hate your enemy. If you grew up like I did just after World War II, you, there were a lot of war movies about the Japanese referred to as Japs, the Germans referred to as Nazis, and we were supposed to hate them both. Now today, we get our best automobiles from the Germans and the Japanese. <laughs> it's interesting. We, we went through this period of time where we're supposed to just really hate these people, right? And you watch the movies, and you're like, oh, they're really bad. And every child was pretending that they were fighting the Japanese or they were fighting the Germans. And, and then uh, I don't remember what, what time it was, but when I suddenly realized you're a German, Bill. <laughs> hmm, think I'm, in, think I'm in trouble. I'm supposed to hate me. <laughs> and, and, and the rest of us, anyone else here got a surname that's German? You're not going to admit it? Okay, thank you. Some of you are admitting it. <laughs> Hatred of our enemies is really kind of normal, isn't it? Sure is in the political environment we're at right now. One person gets angry and, and they get everyone else angry, right? And, and, if, and if, you're, if you're missing out on anger, just watch another debate. <laughs> Hatred of our enemies is really natural. It's interesting, even the Bible actually told us, and God actually said, we we're actually supposed to love our what? Our neighbor, and hate who? Well, the Old Testament said, love your neighbor and hate who? Your enemy. Your enemy. That's exactly what the word said. In fact, it would have been hard, wouldn't it? have been for Joshua and the children of Israel to go in and to occupy the land if they started loving the people? Isn't that one of the reasons why they're told not to associate with them, but just get rid of them immediately? And you have the problem once they start associating with, because then they start marrying, and then they start accepting the gods, and all kinds of bad stuff starts to happen because they don't clean out the land so that they're only focused on one god. Hate, interesting. And we've all been taught that hatred is a very bad thing, and, and, and frankly, it is bad, isn't it? None of us wants to see our neighbors killed by an enemy, do we? None of us wants to be in an environment like what occurred down in San Bernardino or like what occurs in Syria or Iran or Iraq. We, we don't want to see people that we care about being killed by our enemies, Nevertheless, Jesus told us to do what? To love. To love your enemies. Maybe he was just joking. I mean, maybe he didn't really mean that we needed to love them. Come on, folks. These are hard words, aren't they? Hatred is a very natural thing. You've heard it said. An eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. This from, and the text that we'll look at today is from Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 38 through 42. Verse 38 says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. This is referred to as the law of retaliation. <laughs> Some of you say, oh yeah, we get to retaliate, right? Get to get back at somebody else for something they've done. Well, no, it's broader than that. It's referred to as the lex talionis. This law required that the punishment had to match the crime. Now, if, if one person is really wealthy and the penalty is they have to pay a fine, the wealthy person is not going to feel that fine like the poor person, are they? And that's why you have lex talionis, the law of retaliation. God set it up that if I poked your eye out, you could poke my eye out. If I took your lamb, you could take my lamb. If I stole property from you, you could take, take my property from me. And there was this equal wrong 
for the wrong. This punishment that had to match the crime. And don't we all kind of feel that way? If I'm suffering, I want you to suffer too. If you do something to me, I want to get you back. But the point of it is is not that we do the retaliating, but God gives authority to deal with us and our wrong. The the interesting thing is, is that in the midst of this, Jesus brings transformation. Jesus brings a new message. Jesus has what's referred to as a transforming initiative. And we're going to look as we see this. There's more than one of these in our text that we're looking at this morning where Jesus says, okay, here's the way it's been, but I've got something new I'm going to do. Here's what we've all believed. This is the way we've lived, but I'm going to transform things into something totally different than what we've been doing. Incidentally, Jesus does not come to abolish the law, does he? Before we go further into our text, if you have your Bibles, look at Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to do what? To fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be any means disappear, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven." Jesus says, I'm fulfilling the law. I'm coming to meet its requirements. I'm not, ab- I'm not abandoning it. I'm not abolishing it. I'm not saying it does. In fact, you ought to still live this way. Now, which one of those Ten Commandments do you think we should just get rid of? Think about these. Those Ten Commandments are incredible instructions for life. The first four talk about our relationship with God and we really shouldn't have any other gods, should we? We shouldn't honor anything else. We ought to have a time that we set apart as sacred and holy, that's focused on God and God alone. We really shouldn't be cussing and swearing using the name of the, the Lord in vain, should we? This is the, the words really are, are valuable to us for us to honor God in all that we do. And then the second six commandments also speak to that too. What's the benefit of committing adultery? The ruin of more than one family. Or coveting what your neighbor has. It's just going to give you a stomachache. Or, or murdering your neighbor. Or stealing from your neighbor. See, the instructions of the Ten Commandments are, are just as valid for today as they were when God first gave them. We're still supposed to live by them. What, we know, what we're not supposed to be doing is getting all these extra details and dots and tittles and somehow coming up with extra laws that really went way beyond. And that's, that was the weight of the Pharisees that they were putting on the people was you've got to do all this detailed stuff. How do you keep the Sabbath? Well, let's tell you how to keep the Sabbath. And so they wrote the Midrash and, and they wrote big books like this describing here's how you keep the Sabbath. Why don't we just keep the Sabbath? Jesus doesn't say stop honoring this special time on a weekly basis. There's this routine that God created that we all need, regardless of what we're going through. We need a day a week where we stop working, stop focusing on all the other stuff, and give our thoughts to God and allow him to refresh us. Jesus doesn't abolish the law. Instead, he fulfills, he transforms it, he turns it into new life. Let's go back to our text, verse 39. Matthew chapter 5. He says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, then turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, then give them your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. 
Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus, instead of retaliating, give them something extra. Give them something special. Don't don't just comply with their request, with their demand. Surprise them with something. And remember the context of this was the Roman guards, the Roman soldiers could demand a local non-Roman to walk a mile for them. If a Roman soldier came up and slapped you on the cheek, would you fight them? Well, that was kind of the mindset of the Jew, wasn't it? And instead he says, if they slap you on one cheek, turn them the other. If somebody says, hey, I want what you've got there. I want your coat. How how is it? Lost my text. I want your shirt. Okay, good. Here's my coat too. This is the idea of proactive grace. You're going to do something unusual that's going to surprise them and change their thinking. You've heard, in fact, think about this one. It's the transforming grace of a Jim Elliot. Most of you have heard his story. He goes, he goes down to Latin America. He comes with a tribe, and these tri- there's a tribe of people that do kill people. And, and, he, and there's a whole bunch more to the story, so you can read about the, the background behind the story as to why they actually come and start this fight, and they actually kill Jim and his friends. The, the, the amazing thing about it is that Jim and his friends all had shotguns, fully loaded. And not one of them shot once at any of these Indians. And they die. And later, now this is transforming grace, they took her husband and she and her son, Mrs. Elliot and her son, go back to the very same chief, to the very same tribe, and they win them to Jesus Christ. And today they are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. See, that's transforming grace. That's giving something that's not deserved. It's what Jesus did with the woman at the well. She comes to the well and he has her draw water for him and he talks to her about life-giving water and he will even confront her about her lifestyle. And she'll go back and tell the crowd, I've met a man, a man, by the way, who's a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and we don't talk to them and they don't talk to us, but he talked to me and he told me everything I've ever done and he welcomed me. It's transforming grace. Jesus goes on in verse 43. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, who's your neighbor? And you might remember the discussion of the, the man who, the religious man who comes to Jesus and says, you know, I've really been doing a lot of wonderful things. Now, who is my neighbor, Jesus? Since if that's the way I'm going to get experience eternal life, who is my neighbor? And Jesus says, well, let's talk about that. And he tells a story. And it's about two religious men, a Levite and a priest, and they're walking down the road one at a time, and they come to a man, a Jew, who's been, had his clothing taken from him, all of his possessions, and he's laying there on the side of the road dying. And each one of them has spiritual responsibility, folks. Both the Levite and the priest, each one, they're heading to the temple. That's why they're going the direction they are. They're heading up to Jerusalem. They are going to be doing their religious duties. If they stop and touch this man, they become unclean and they're not able to go do the work that they've been called to do for their whole life. And that's to go to the temple and to serve God. So they don't stop. They don't touch him. They walk around and keep on going. But a Samaritan who is not really concerned about cleanness, he's already unclean. He stops, helps the man, takes him to a motel, provides food and money and protection for him and offers to come back. At the end of the story, Jesus forces this man, who's who's my neighbor? And Jesus asks him, who was the neighbor? The man who operated from transforming grace was the neighbor. The Samaritan, the enemy, was the neighbor. And Jesus says, 
Verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Isn't it easy to love people that are being nice to you and loving to you? But look, here's where the real benefit comes in. Not when you're loving the people who think you're wonderful, but when you're loving the people who think you're horrible. When you love your enemy. And not even the tax collectors not even the tax collectors are doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Tax collectors, they, they greet fellow tax collectors. Even the people on the mountain who despise God and people of other races greet one another. So 27 of them were arrested on Wednesday. So even those of us who sin do things that are nice. But Jesus invites us to do something unusual, do something extraordinary. Well, how does he say it? To bless instead of curse. Romans 12, verse 9 and following, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. There, see, it's okay to hate evil, right? Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. How? Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who, what? Persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil. Anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Bless and do not curse. Is that what we're taught to do with our enemies? we need to remember the passage that I read earlier before communion we too were enemies of God and while we were enemies Christ blessed instead of cursed Christ has modeled and demonstrated for us what we need to do. The unusual, the special, the supernatural. Jesus gives up everything so that we can experience his love. And he does that instead of retaliating as we deserve. And then what does he say? Do the same. Matthew 5, 48 says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We need to do what God does. We need to be perfect like Him. Do you remember Rome, how Rome got their peace? Rome was able, the Pax Romana, it's a famous concept, and they were able to have this huge empire because of the peace that they were able to maintain. One of the ways they maintained it was the roads that they built, which allowed the, an army to get from one end of the Roman Empire to another very quickly, a lot faster than they used to. And that right there tells you the key to Roma, Pax Romana. The key to Pax Romana was the Roman sword. Powerful and mighty. And it was that sword that maintained peace. That's the context that Jesus comes into. The world and Rome is saying, you get peace by killing people. You get peace with a sword. You get peace with meanness. You get peace with brutality. But what does Jesus say? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. You know what happened to Rome 300 years after Jesus died? 
and rose from the dead, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And it did this without ever picking up a sword, unless you talk about the one that Peter used against the, but that was a Jewish guard. They did this without ever picking up a sword, waging a battle, or fighting back. Simply happened one person at a, at a time as the followers of Jesus lived out this message that Jesus had given to them. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 to 5, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but they have power to break down strongholds. If you look at that passage, it says, verse 1 says, by the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. Notice, he's starting off with Christ who was humble, Christ who was gentle. I'm going to appeal to you from his view of things. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you when away, that's a whole conversation he's having with, with uh, the Corinthians because they're saying, oh, he's really nasty when he writes, but he's a wimp when he's in front of us. And so Peter's, excuse me, Paul's making fun of himself. And he says, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect towards some of you who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We're in a battle. And that battle is to control our thoughts and our actions to become more like Christ. And we have incredible supernatural weapons. And if we will use them, God will do miraculous things. What we've been discussing is that Jesus offers us transforming grace. The tools to deal even in a violent, mean, and nasty, angry culture and community. See, transforming grace is what took hold of the mother of the 20-year-old girl who was killed by a drunk driver. These are the words of Rene Napier. I never understood why God would ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, the son he waited so long to have. I also always hoped he would never require such a sacrifice of me. Once my first child, a son, was born, I really couldn't understand how Abraham just did what God told him to do. The love a parent has for a child is like no other. God also blessed me with three daughters, the last two being ident identical twins. I love my children with all my heart and could never imagine living without one of them. I now have a mission I did not choose. Rene Napier does DUI presentations across the country. On May 11, 2002, 24-year-old drunk driver Eric killed one of my twins, Megan, and one of her best friends, Lisa. Both girls were 20 years old. This was devastating for all three families involved. Take note. What are the three families? Megan, her daughter, the twin, Lisa and her family, her friend, and Eric and his family. Eric, the 24-year-old who was driving drunk and ended up causing the death of these two girls. All three families were devastated and countless friends that mourned the loss of these precious girls. But this is also a story of forgiveness and healing. My family and Lisa's family chose to forgive Eric. Did you hear that? My family and Lisa's family chose to forgive Eric. We even appealed to have his 22-year prison sentence reduced to 11 years. Since March 29, 2004, I have traveled all over the country telling this story to thousands of people, mostly teenagers. I always talk about forgiveness because we have learned how powerful it is for everyone. I show him via video in my presentations and will soon have him as an inmate standing with me, a living, breathing example of the dangers of drunk driving, but also of the power of forgiveness. 
that was not easy. In fact, let's play the video which gives you this more in her story from Matthew West. A woman named Renee Napier wrote to me from Florida and she shared with me about how she has a mission in her life that she never would have chosen for herself. And she's been on a journey of stepping out of the darkness of bitterness and anger and into the light of forgiveness. Um, she's been asked to do the impossible and the reason she's been asked to do the impossible is because her 20 year old daughter was driving home from the beach one night in Florida when her car was struck by a drunk driver. Uh, the drunk driver was a 24 year old kid named Eric who by all accounts was actually a really great kid um, but he was out and made some bad decisions one night and for the first time got behind the wheel of his car drunk. Uh, Eric took the uh, lives of both Renee's daughter and her daughter's best friend both girls died that night and Eric um, his life came to a screeching halt Renee's life came to a screeching halt and everybody involved was in shock Eric was sentenced to 22 years in prison uh, because of the crime he committed and here's this grieving mother left to somehow try and pick up the pieces of life after she's had to do what no parent should ever have to do say goodbye to her child she said she was in the darkest place that she'd ever been in her life um, she was filled with hatred and anger towards the man who was behind bars. And any one of us on the outside could look at that story and say, well, I, I understand that. I get that. In fact, when I read her story, I thought about my two little girls, you know. And the first thought I had is if anybody ever tried to harm my children, I don't know that I would have it in me to forgive as God commands us to forgive. And yet, as the months uh, began to pile up, she felt like God was putting it on her heart that uh, she was the one, even though he was behind bars, she was the one being held prisoner. And uh, God just began to remind her, hey, I did the impossible and forgave you. I sent my son for you. Now, if you want to be free, you need to go and forgive this man. So she reached out to Eric behind bars and said, hey, I serve a God who commands me to forgive. So I want you to know that I, I'm setting it free. I'm forgiving you. More importantly, I want you to know that um, God can forgive you too. Little did she know that that would um, change that young man's life. And behind bars, this prisoner, Eric, accepted Jesus into his heart as his own personal Savior. A powerful story of what forgiveness can do. The story didn't end there, though. Renee began to develop an unlikely friendship with this young man. And her whole family began to embrace this young man. And now they feel like they lost a daughter, but... Strangely, they've gained a son. Renee worked with the courts in Florida and had his sentence cut in half from 22 years to 11 years. At the time I was writing this song, I had no idea that this was going on. So I'm writing these, these songs about setting a prisoner free. And little did I know that this November, Eric is going to be released from prison. And he'll be standing side by side with Renee. Renee goes around the country and shares at schools about the dangers of drunk driving. Now Eric's going to be out of prison standing next to her. She said they're not just going to share about the dangers of drunk driving anymore, but also about the power of forgiveness. And I'll sing that last verse again. And uh, these words took on new significance when I found out that Eric was free and Renee was free. It'll clear the wilderness away. It can even set a prisoner free. There is no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really frees is you. Forgiveness. I don't know what's going on in your life, what enemy you're battling with. And I, and I know that God doesn't expect somebody to put up with sexual abuse. I know he doesn't expect us to, to recognize and, and just keep affirming somebody who's doing something horribly nasty. But there are supernatural power in doing what Jesus invites us to do. When he says to love our enemies, to, do, to surprise them,